behold, I am coming soon. Between the years of 1984 and 1999, Apostle Alfred Williams was taken to heaven on various occasions where he was shown global events that would lead up to the year of 2015. And in 1999, the Apostle was powerfully shown the coming calendar for the world. I want to understand that the first war was in heaven, the first victory was in heaven, and it takes the man of heaven to win the earthly battle. In December 2009, God instructed Apostle Alfred Williams to go into all the world and let them know that I am coming. Beloved, with this powerful instruction behind us, it is now time for us to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Now is the time for the final preparation of the Bride of Christ. A final trumpet call to righteousness in this time that is running out before the rapture of the church. Join us on this dynamic campaign to reach every house in Britain. They need to hear the call. Who will tell them if we do not? This is the prophesied time of harvest. It is now time for us to win every house for Jesus. For more information, call 020 7635 0447 or visit cftchurches.org. The time has come to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon. And you will discover that that is, I'm talking about apostles' teachings, anything contrary to the apostles, is out of apostles' teachings that sound doctrine principle came about. But you'll find out that people who teach error have nothing in the gospel to back it up. And sound doctrine is different from application of the scripture. In application of the scripture, people call it doctrine, but it's not a doctrine. Let me say this, holiness is a doctrine. But when people read the book about holiness, they may apply or what you may call interpret it in a different format. And that interpretation has gone totally away from the written word. Then that is a wrong doctrine. Um, prosperity is a doctrine. But when people begin to apply the teachings on prosperity, then they will go into various things that is not in the scripture. But when we look at the doctrine of prosperity, it is, the Bible speaks. It does not need interpretation. Or, you know, all those uh, exegetes people do. And that is where you, you can understand the difference between a wrong doctrine and a right doctrine. Also, there are people who teach doctrines of Old Testament. Like, um, under the doctrine of angels, deliverance error come under the doctrine of angels. Because people do not have, the, most of them do not have the sound theological uh, understanding about who are angels. We are going to treat that in this, in this section a little bit. And so, you know, they have a manner of doctrines talking about taking salt to your mother's grave and pouring salt to your mother's grave. It's not in the scriptures, but they began by, they taught that from trying to teach about generational issues. Generational curses is also a wrong doctrine because it is unscriptural. Even the Old Testament said when Christianity comes, it will come to an end. But those who teach wrong doctrine, the symptoms of them is that they do not read the Bible. When anybody comes out with a lie, if it is something that is profitable, they will pick that up and they will run with it. So in their operation, they are all narrow-minded. So that when you now bring out the scriptures that, you know, you know, reveals that error, they have no excuse. When we get to that now, I will show you on the doctrine of generational curses, or doctrine of demons, or doctrine of um, prosperity. I will show you how those ones are diffused. Now, yeah. I think we taught one of the conditions yesterday from the instruction Paul gave Titus about divisive people. All right. Excommunication from the church. The word excommunication, let me not use it. Because if I use the word excommunication, people can think it's a holy word. Excommunication means remove from fellowship. Do we get it? It's not a sanctimonious word. So to excommunicate means 
to remove someone from. All right. So when can we remove someone from fellowship? There are many things that people can do to warrant removal from fellowship. One of it we treated yesterday, which we will treat others in Timothy, some others. If somebody is divisive in the church, and you know that he's going about scheming, talking about this person against that, talking or passing information that can kill the fellowship, that can kill the morale, uh, Paul told you, call him and tell him and warn him. First time, leave him and give him a breath. If he does that again, call him second time and warn him. But when you call that person, the procedure is, which we see in Timothy, you will call those who alleged it to sit down and in his face, they will tell you what he had done. And you must get two witnesses. Maybe two people he had done to do those stuff to. They will sit down and you won't tell him what you are doing. You will just invite him and invite those two people. They won't know why. And when they get there, so that they cannot, their mind cannot be used by Satan to lie. When he comes in that he doesn't know what you, you call him for, you know why he's a pastor and son stuff. I say, look, this is why I've called you guys. Show them the scripture as in that title, chapter 3. And say, brother, you told me something about this brother. Can you say it now? He will say it. And you tell the brother, don't react. Just listen. Second person speak. And you tell the brother, before the Lord, this is the word of God. Don't lie. Did you say that? Because the intention of correcting somebody is to bring him to the place of penitence where he can repent. But the Bible has established that if the first order someone did such a mistake and you warn him and you leave him and he did it second time and you do the same thing to warn him, if he did it again, then he didn't make a mistake. He had decided to be reprobate. And that's what you saw in Titus yesterday. Then such a person as communication or taken away from fellowship you will come to the church and read the book of Titus and the book of First Corinthians uh, chapter, I will give you that when we get there. That uh, Paul said that if any, you know, the boy who was sleeping with the mother's, uh, with the father's wife, when I, when you worship and the spirit of God is present and my spirit is present, given to the devil, you will now say that this person had done this. According to the scripture, we have on this date, I call this on this and this what we did, you, you know, instructed, he, and we left him. Again, he did it. We call these witnesses, and again, he did it. According to the scripture, therefore, I remove you from fellowship in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When they say that to a man, between this place and that door, he could be finished by hell. The covering will move instantly because you have followed the word of truth. And the purpose of that is that Satan and demons will attack him and they will deal with him in ruthless form so that he can repent. That may lead to his death. That is what Corinthians tells us. When we look at it, we see. So that he can repent so that his soul will not go to hell. But it's possible for him to repent in that affliction and the Lord will restore him and rebuke those spirits. And that's the reason why what I'm telling you to teach, you know, Many Christians don't know God, you know. They know they, they hear about the God of love, the God of love. Judgment of God really is more than his love. And people need to know that God is not a is not a God of nonsense. So we we'll look at other things that can bring in uh, uh, communication, but that's not what we are looking at now. We are looking at what I have taught you. I am looking at this. You weren't there when I was teaching. Okay. What is your question has to do with doctrine? With doctrine? Or with... Um, okay, ask me. If it's doctrine, we want to do it later. But if it's something else, not doctrine. Uh, yes. Feel. Yep.
wonders even when it is not of God. How, do, how does a young Christian, for example, yeah. Yeah. discover that this one is not of the Holy Spirit? We treated it yesterday. And uh, when I was talking about um, the shepherd and the church, and I was talking about what the Bible commands the shepherd to teach. But in the lecture that I'm taking you to now, so that your people can come to maturity, in the lecture I'm taking you to now, we will deal with um, some aspect of that. But the fact is this. If you teach your church according to what I've shared with you, those who belong to you are the devotees. They cannot fall a victim of that. The fundamental reason why Christians are toast to and fro is because there's no sound teaching. And we look at that. Ephesians, the pastor is just telling them stories to keep them at bay. So they do not have true knowledge of who they really are and all stuff like that. Plus, if the pastor does not operate in the power of God, then most people can be easily deceived by counterfeit. And I told you at the end of this last session that a minister, the, what is the key to signs and wonders? Prayer. Say it loud. Prayer. That's it. So I will not come to pulpits if the God that sent me will not back up my claim. <coughs> Bible says, and the Lord accompanied their word with signs and wonders. I followed it. So if in my church, God cannot use me for signs and wonders. I will either resign and go and seek face of I'm not talking about resign as a minister, but leave the pulpit and go and fast and pray. That's the only way to get the power. But I have told you that if your mind is clogged, don't even dare to pray or fast. You are going on hunger strike. Because in the book of Peter, it says what? Be clear-minded. So that and I've taught you all this in the previous lecture. They will get me now. So the operating power is very cheap. Very easy. Two ways you can operate in miracles. By the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is an endowment of God, which you didn't work for. You didn't ask for it. God just gave it to you. Like some of you are tall, some of you are short, some of you, your nose is pointed, your nose is flat. All things like that. But also, you can earn it by seeking the face of God. Which everybody can. So if a minister is very obedient to God, God will be obedient to affirm him. An obedient minister to Christ will preach, will heal the sick. You remember all the tasks of a minister? Heal the brokenhearted, heal the sick, <coughs> care for the lost, bring back the three. Isaiah, uh, uh, Jeremiah, what? Uh, 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 Ezekiel chapter 34. So, once a minister, those things I taught you from Monday, sit down. There are many things I say that I don't expect you to remember everything now. But there are many things I say when you get home and you sit down, really, you know, really as a minister for two, three months, just take a part, listen again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And you are writing actions that you take again and again. When you finish the first lecture, because the lecture I gave you one day, you can listen to it for one week. To be able to understand it put fully. But it's a total solution for your ministry. Then you move to the next day lecture, another week. Write things down. You will hear more. Really, I, I wish that people who write my book are listening to me. Because what I've been teaching you is volumes of books. Somebody who can pick one of the tapes and write. You can write a real book out of this. They will get it now. It is the heart of God for us to prosper. Even as Christians. It is the heart of God for him to lavish his power upon us as Christians. Talk less. You appointed shepherd. The Lord wants to do that more to the shepherd. So that he can show for the shepherd that this is the one I called. And a little consistency and dedication, which is devotion, will just take you behind the line. Do we get it now? But let's go into this. Satanic influence is... Overcoming satanic influences. The, why am I teaching satanic influences? First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, In the last days many will desire the faith and follow the saving spirit. And uh, 
things taught by demons. Not only that, the book of Thessalonians tells us that the, 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 the secret power of the lawless man is at work. And it says it comes like a manifestation of miraculous signs and wonders which deceive the people. In Matthew 24, verse 4, Jesus says, Watch out that you are not deceived. So, churches need to know that Satan, sit, who Satan is, number one, who demons are, number two, and um, how he fell, number three, and how he now operates. So that you will be able to guide your flock against the wolf. So in this lecture, therefore, we will look for, first of all, at who is Satan. And I'll give you scriptures. Then we'll look at who are demons. And I'll give you scriptures. Then we'll look at what are the operations of the devil. I'm not concentrating on the, on the world. I'm concentrating on the church, in the church. How does Satan operate in the church? Then we'll look at methods. The three principal methods of Satan, or you may call it, the aim of Satan is achieved by three major principles. And what the principles are. What he said is how to do. Then we talk about keeping your body clean. Under that, you look at devil is seeking to possess your body. The aim of Satan, the goal of Satan. Then overcoming the devil. Another subtitle on that, we look at resist the devil. Don't worry, I'll take you through. Resist the devil. Change your mindset. Act the acts of sinful nature. And then we will be finished with this lecture. Now let me take you to the first one. Who is Satan? Isaiah 40, 14, 12. It says, How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star? And the other translation says, O Lucifer, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. So Satan is a falling star. Okay? When we get to the book of Revelations in chapter 12, if you read from verse 1 to 6, it talks about the stars of heaven and it refers to them as angels. So Satan is a fallen angel. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. Put that on the board and 18. When the 12, uh, 22 came and were, were thanking Jesus that demons submit to them, Jesus said, uh, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So it just said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And the Bible says in Isaiah 14, 12, you have been cast down to the earth. And it's from heaven. It's talking about Lucifer. Now, let us look at the book of Ezekiel 28, verse 11 to 16. Put it on the board, please. Ezekiel talks much more about Satan. He says, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take up a lamentation against the king of Tar and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, you were a, the model of perfection. I want to look at that, those statements. The model of perfection. This is Satan. When God created beings, all beings in heaven. He decided to lavish his intelligence to create one being who will be the most perfect being. So that in beauty, when people look at that, they can appreciate the craftsmanship of God. So he created Lucifer as that. So in heaven, other angels, other beings, they envy him. They look at him and they shake their head. He's extreme beauty. They look at him and they appreciate God for his excellence. So he walked among them in that position. 
But then he says, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, verse 13. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. And this is what tells you that this statement is referring to Satan. Because in Eden, you have Adam and Eve. The third one that showed up in chapter 3 was Satan. It says, you are in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorn you, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, oxen, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and baal. These were the, the things that God mixed together to create him. So when you look at Satan, he's glittering, he's, you know, you know so much. <coughs> yeah. But if you look at something that always interests me about Satan, it says your settings and mountains were made of gold. In other words, when you look at this, that Satan, you see some of the gems are crystallized, some were oxen, jasper, sapphire, but in the midst of their joints is gold. That is what we call setting in engineering. That is like when you put blocks together, the setting of the block, the joints of the block is mortar. Now, along the hands of Satan, you will see gold, 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 gold. And you see here, the rest of the body is gems, gems, various gems. In the wrist is gold. <coughs> now, if you look at this, it says, Your settings and mountains were made of gold. On the day you were created, you were prepared. It says, You were anointed as a garden cherub. So he was a garden cherub. Or so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. Now, I want to get some understanding about the holy mountain of God. I can begin to imagine what some of the things in the presence of God. So, the mountain of God, the throne of God, is on the highest mountain in heaven. This tells you that there is mountain in heaven, there is low valley, there is river. As you have in the earth, you have in heaven. So, he says, you are on the holy mountain of God, you walked among the fairy stones. You can imagine stones and their fire. Those stones that are fairy stones. Look at sun. A sun in this, when, you, when it's zoomed into sun, the sulfur goes boom, boom. So on, in heaven, by the altar of God, you have these stones and they are fire. They are flashing fire. They are red hot stones, but they breathe out fire all over the whole place. And these are pillars that guide the throne of the Father. When you look at the throne of the Father afar, you can see those things. The Bible talks about the cherubs who who flies around in the throne and when these cherubs come in when they fly around and they come back they cover their faces with one wing they cover their feet with one wing two sets of a set of wings yeah and then with one set they fly and when they get before the throne they have covered their faces because you cannot look at the throne and they keep flapping and saying holy 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 is the lord god almighty that is their role from eternity to, from when they were made to eternity. The throne of God is very terrifying. If God lets you see. But I think around the throne, because I have been into this before, is the blinding light that forms the gates. When the gate of the throne opens, because this one is talking about the real throne. In the midst of this, God has a seat where he sits. In the midst of this one. But you see, the region of the throne, like you have a garden of somebody before you drive far to his house. Uh -huh. I have been to that place, but I haven't been to the throne before him. Exactly. But that place has light. And the, the door is of light. I'm sure that be behind the light will be some mysterious, you know, gigantic, beautiful gates or something like that. But I've not been permitted to go beyond the light. And uh, twice, I suppose, among the times that I've seen that, that light opens like this, like a gate.
But as the light opens like this, in the midst of it is the light and light. Out of which I saw a cherub flew out. And the cherub was a light. Until the cherub reached me before I recognized it's a beam. As it's coming closer, it looks like a little star coming out. And as it's coming closer, it's getting bigger and bigger. So which means that where even I was standing could be several millions of miles away from the throne. Because when something can look like a small pin, little ball, and is of my height and, you know, of my size. I'm explaining this to you for you to understand the privilege that Satan had. Many angels cannot even uh, go by the lights. They can't reach where the light is, the entrance. And many angels look at that mountain from afar, ever. They cannot go beyond. But Satan is be beyond the gates, and he is just by the very throne that the Father is, where you have all this, you know, you know, fairy stones. Look at the next verse. It says, you were blameless. You can't be there and be corrupt. From the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. <clears throat> because you know it was full of wisdom. And when God gives you something, he does not manipulate it. He allows you to use it freely. So this is how Satan manufactured wickedness. From the wisdom that God gave him, he now decided to pervert. It was a false pervert. But the wisdom was pure. You, can, you, you shouldn't have problem understanding this because many ministers, God anointed them and God used them so mightily. They were faithful and God was the moment they, are, they become an empire, they begin to lie. With the same gift, but the gift is not called off. When they have lost contact with God completely, they can still open the Bible and teach powerful message. But God is no more there. Because the gift that he gives to man is without repentance. In other words, he doesn't call it back until when you report to him in judgment. That is our God. So this is the reason why Satan could use that wisdom to manufacture the false wickedness that was found in him. The next verse. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in what? In disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stone. Now, what I'm taking you to is, who is Satan? Now you understand who Satan is. He was a guardian cherub. He was the model of perfection, of beauty. He was made with gems and many stones. Read the King James Version says that, he was, you know, he mentioned the word harp. In, in him, in his mountains, in his settings, was harp. This harp you play. And so Satan was the controller of worship, the music leader. That's the reason why Satan always goes for music leaders in churches. And they can begin to sleep with women. And defile themselves. So, and that's the reason why Satan is using music a lot in this time to try to uh, wage war against the church. Because he was the controller of music. He get it now. And God didn't take it from him. Okay. So, haven't known that. Verse, is that verse 16? 17. 17. Okay. So we now know who Satan is beyond reasonable doubt. Then who are demons? Write the scriptures down so that you can teach it. <clears throat> who are demons? Revelation chapter 3, verse chapter 12, verse 3 to 4. It says, then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and horns and seven crowns in his head. This is talking about Lucifer. He still swept a third of the stars, you remember the word stars, out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child and uh, her child the moment it was born. Now, here the Bible is talking about a great sign, a dragon, you know, 
his tail swept a third of the stars. And we have known that stars refer to angels. But that scripture continues in verse 7. It says, and there was war in heaven because of the attitude of this dragon. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. So understand that Satan has angels. Okay? But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. Okay? The great dragon who was hauled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. Who leads the whole world astray. Was hauled down to where? The ark. And his angels with him. So demons are angels. What we call fallen angels. That is the scripture. <laughs> and I can tell you from as a son of a wizard that that is true in occultism. Because some Christians argue about this. That's why I just said that. Haven't we known now who Satan is? And we have known what demons are. Then we understand the fact that all demons of hell are angels. All right? But they have been disrobed. They are no more glorified because they have been desecrated. But what God built in them, in wisdom, in knowledge, is still in them. What God built in them, in strength, is still with them. So they have the strength of angel. A little demon is an angel. He has the strength of an angel. He can change himself from small tiny thing to a big, you know, humongous look. He can change from, uh, you know, uh, if he can be, become a pen now. And as you are looking at it, he will just change from pen to a lion, like, you know, you know metamorphosis. And from there, he can just change to, uh, you know, a dragon. The, it's an angel. They can move with the wind. They can afflict a nation. Talk less, individuals. The power God gives to them is still in them. Are you with me now? That is the reason why for humanity to be free from angels, from, from, from demons, God became man. God became man so that he can dwell inside mortal man. And it's only those that the God who created the angels dwell in that can overpower any angel by the God in him. That's the mystery of salvation that many don't understand. You carry God. If you carry God, angel can become anything. He's still an ordinary angel. Shall be a foreign angel. He can turn to mountain, turn to flood, turn to wild wind. That is not the wind that will blow you. He can turn to lion. He cannot scratch your body. Because of the one inside you. He's the one that made him. Is God not most wise? Is he not most knowledgeable? When he cast the devil out of the heavens and threw him to the earth and the devil was gallivanting over the earth thinking that he's got everybody. The first image of God, he defiled it. By his wisdom. Defiled Adam and Eve. Took over the rulership. Ready to oppress humanity. And he did. And God decided to come by himself. The battle of heaven was by angels. But the battle to reclaim the earth was by God. Which means this earth really is very important before God. You know? These are demons. And they are nothing more than this. If you look at it, there are four. What are the operations of devils? Of the devil? Very quickly. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 to 10. The operations of the devil. Second Thessalonians 2, 9 to 10. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the works of Satan. Displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused 
to love the truth and be saved. There are two things I want to understand here. Lawlessness is one of the operations of the devil. Well, the capstone of his work is to make man lawless. Now, his approach to deceive man into lawlessness, of course, well, he wants to make man lawless, but his approach is deception. It will deceive a man so that a man can become lawless. They will get it now. But one of the ingredients he uses in deception is miracles, signs, and wonders. But the Bible calls it counterfeit. So if the Bible says something is counterfeit, it means there is original. Is there somebody in the house? Yes, sir. You and I, we are the original. <laughs> Do you know something therefore, from what I taught you before on building a healthy church? That's the reason why it is not a matter of maybe or may not be for you and I to operate in the power of miracles. We, we are mandated to. You can imagine if you do not operate in miracles and Satan wants to finish you, he doesn't have much problem. He will just send one of his boys to come and buy the church beside you. He will operate in the counterfeit miracle and people can, in your church can't see any miracle. They will go to that place thinking that's the real place. Listen to me. The only way we can outwit the devil is by operating the true power of God. So that people can see the difference between the uh, original and the counterfeit. <laughs> Hello? And the easy way to enter the power is to pray regularly. That's why Satan engages us with many things to try and make sure not to pray well. Tactically. He will engage your time. You will postpone prayer, postpone prayer, postpone prayer, postpone prayer until prayer himself is tired. <laughs> He's tired of you. <laughs> Hello? We have to fight ourselves out of this body that, that his, the destiny of your body is to be eaten by worms, decay and worm. This body does not like you. He is not going to heaven. He is going to the ground to be eaten. So that is the reason why the body always wants to drag you down to the ground. Always wants to push you to the ground. You have to kill it. You have to bruise it. You have to punish it. For you to be able to read the spiritual things. Your body will not give up until you, he sees that you, are really the, you, are really, you have really decided to kill him. Then he will just behave. <laughs> that is the body. That is the body. Look at when you want to build your muscles. You have to go to gym, isn't it? The first thing you go to gym, you have pain, don't you? And when you tell your, your trainer, ah, it's painful, what does he tell you? Do it again. <laughs> Do it again. Do it again. Until that body is used to what? Suffer. And then he gets used. And that suffering will turn it, turn the fat to muscles. Same thing with his spirit. Satan. Lawlessness. Method. Approach. Deception. And method. Miraculous signs. Counterfeit. I wonder. In Matthew 24 verse 4. Jesus says. He said Jesus answered. Watch out that you are not what? That no one deceives you. And the second operation of Satan. Is using human beings. To deceive others. Satan in the church will try to make church lawless directly using his demons. Then he will try to make members to influence members or deceive members so that members can be lawless. That is all the issue of deception, backbiting, the story of another person looks sweet, especially if it is a bad story. But their testimony doesn't look too exciting devil is the one behind it. What I cannot talk about you, before you, why should I say behind you? I should say anything behind you, which I will say right before your eyes. So if I practice that, 
I have no reason to run you down. Are you with me now? Because can I run you down before you? So Satan uses man, human being, to also deceive the church. Let me tell you something. I feel I should stand up. Let me tell you something, brethren. You know, one of the greatest uh, delusions of the church, which is hypocrisy, is a silent hypocrisy, is this. The Bible says, do not take the accusation of one man, the judge. But is that not what many Christians do? Somebody came to you and told you that you see that person and all what he says to you, before you know it, it has influenced your behavior to that person. Without really verifying from him. Now, now let me say this to you. If you and I were Satan, so how do we weaken the church? It's just by selling bad information to the first one and about the second one. And then use that second one to go and tell somebody else. And use that one to tell somebody else. And use that so that in a short time, several people will just be having suspicion against themselves. We lie to you about him. Then we will lie to him about you. And then we will lie to him about you. So as you uh, do not uh, you know, like him, uh, he will not like you and he will not like you and Whatever a man saw it, that he repeat. That's what the devil will base his principle upon, and it will work. Are you with me now? Yes, sir. I told them in London Church very recently. When people do something, or they say something, it will be strange for you to say in your mind, I think this is what he means. Are you good? You can interpret women. When the Bible says you should not interpret women. If you say something to me, or you did something, instead of me to think what that may be, are you not still alive? Why can't I call you and say that, look, this is what you did. This is what my mind is thinking. Tell me why you do it. What is your intention? Does it cost me anything to ask you that? So why don't I? Say that. Say that. Who is he looking for? Me, not him. He had done what he would do. You know, this is another thing is this. This guy may offend me so terribly. And I challenge him. He says, I'm sorry. I said, that's a lie. That is not a true sorry. Is that how you say sorry? I don't know somebody who has a dictionary of how sorry should be said. Then this man goes to God and pleads his case and between him and God, he receives forgiveness. And I keep feeling hot. Can a man feel hot? Be hot by something? No, I don't believe it. A man cannot be hot by somebody else's behavior. No. A man chooses by himself to be hot by himself. For a behavior that is not hurtful. You have done worse to God. And God is not hurt. So a little thing that man did to you. There are people on earth who will do worse to you. But because of their position to you. You better don't even be hurt. Because you will lose your job. So if you couldn't be hurt because of that. It means that to be hurt. No man makes you hurt. You hurt by yourself my friend. If you die hurt. You will go to a hurt place. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, the devices of Satan. As long as you are hot in your heart against your fellow brother, all prayers you pray not answered. So, if that be the case, you can't see God. So, why should you allow yourself to be hot instead of bottling in your heart things and make you hot? Say it out, even if they will kill you. And if someone says that, I'm sorry, accept. Even if you say to somebody, you hurt me, and he didn't say, I'm sorry, forgive him. How many things have you done against God that you say you are sorry? Is there not many things we do? We don't even know it's wrong. After doing wrong, we still go to God and say, I worship you. I love you, Lord. <laughs> and God will look at us that, well, he's an ignorant. Okay, come, come, come. Okay, what do you want? Take and go. With your ignorance, God didn't say that. But you just did this. You know, 
Our knowledge of sin is determined by our maturity in God. So there are some sins that we know now that is a sin, which a young Christian doesn't know is a sin. He just thinks that is a way of life, you know. Until when we train him and he has more knowledge in God, ha, huh, this thing I've been doing is wrong and voluntarily will change. That is what Christian life is all about. Devil. Devil is operations in the church. Very prolific. And so, in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, the Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. That is happening now a lot in the world. We are looking at the operations of the devil. In the last days, the Bible says here that one of the ways the devil will operate, you know, the first time I told you that the devil himself will deceive directly using demons. The second one is that the devil will use man to deceive man. And the third one is that many people will decide the faith. The, Bible, the, 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 the devil will make them abandon the principle of truth and they will follow deceiving spirit and things taught by demons, which means that some people controlled by demons will preach on pulpits. And that's all over the world. And that's the issue of wrong doctrine. Do you know something? If somebody taught something wrong, he knows that he's a liar. But those who took it, not knowing that he's wrong, the day they read the truth, they change. They change. Now, in this level, let me give you the answers on the doctrine. Because we won't reach Timothy today. We'll do Timothy tomorrow. Now, let me show you this for this, uh, you know, um, scam. Let's look at the doctrine of generational curses. In the doctrine of generational curses, it stems, stems from Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. I think it's verse 4. If you look at Exodus chapter 20, from verse 4, it says, You shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or any th uh, uh, on, on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You, verse 5 says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But verse 6, Showing love to a thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commandment. Now, if you look at this scripture, first of all, the basic principle of false doctrine is that people will take a verse of the Bible out of context and they will make a doctrine of it. It is wrong. The principle that you are taught in Bible school is that read verses before, probably seven verses and verses after to know the, the, the story of that context. And then you have understanding of what he's saying. But if you look at this now, people are saying, I am the Lord thy God who punishes the sins of the Father for the third or fourth generation. That is the context they take out. But what led to this is an idol worshipping. If you worship idol, then I will punish you from this to this. But if you look at that statement also, at the end of it, you say, of those who hate me, I will punish, you know, from fourth to fourth, fourth, uh, for generation of those who hate me. Now they don't read that. So which means that that verse is not applicable to anybody who loves the Lord. Whoever your generation could be. But let me say this, they may not understand that because when people want to, when people look for error, they are look, it's because of self-benefit. So this is their fundamental uh, scripture. But now go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Is another fundamental scripture that they use. He says, What proverb do I see? Is, am I hearing in Israel? Fathers are eating sour grapes, and the teeth of sons are set on edge. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now, if you look at this statement, it's a question. What is this that I'm hearing? God said. Now, if God said, what is this I'm hearing, which means that God doesn't like to hear it. Are you getting me now? Yes, but error 
they will say what is happening as if they don't understand simple English. And they begin to say, Father's eyes are sour grapes, teeth of sons are set on egg. Father's eyes are sour grapes. So father can eat sour grapes and the teeth of sons can set on egg. It's, it's delusion. It's senseless. God said, why are you saying that? But if you look at God didn't finish there, verse 3, it says, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb. That's the next verse. God says, don't say that again. So every minister who have used that statement, they have disobeyed God. Error. By reading the next, reading before, and reading after, you will understand. He says, you shall no longer quote it. If you look at the stories God said there, God said he sold that sin that he shall die. And he gave a scenario of a man who was righteous and his son was wicked. And God says that will I forgive the wickedness of the son for the righteousness of the father? He said, no. He says, all mankind is mine. I will punish the, the son for his wickedness and I will, I will bless the father for his righteousness. It's not that if that wicked boy grew up and had a child and the child now chose the God of his grandfather. He said, will I punish that child for the wickedness of the son? And God says, no. He said, the soul that's not shall die. He said, all mankind is mine. But you know something? Recently I was reading the book of Jeremiah and I found something and I have never in my life stopped at that Jeremiah. I've read Jeremiah well. But I have never seen this. Look at what it says in chapter 30 of Jeremiah. In chapter 30, no, chapter 31, really. In verse 27, he says, this is matter of the fire is in our graves. You know, God said in Ezekiel, you shall not quit again. But look at what it says here. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant the house of Israel. And the house of Judah with the offspring of men and animals. Just as I watch over them to uproot and tear down and to overthrow, destroy and bring disaster. So I will watch over them to build and plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say, the fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. So God says that when the time comes that he will plant the house, the people will not say it again. Now what is that time? When will that time come? Let's see. If you look at it in verse 30, it says, Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. So that when that time comes, nobody's generational curse will come on him. Your father's sin will never come. You cannot repent of the sins of your forefathers from that time. You know, some people have gathered their intercity for nations. Lord, we repent for the sins of our forefathers. It's nonsense. <laughs> With your forefathers. The Bible says here, Instead, in those days, everybody will carry his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. Look at this. This is verse 30. He now says, the time is coming, declares the Lord, verse 31, which I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. When did God make new covenant with the house of Israel? From Christ. Now look at what he says in verse 32. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers, all the seven covenants. The covenant of salt is no more. The covenant of uh, 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 Abrahamic covenant is no more. All those covenants are come to an end. He said, I, will, I, will, I, I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke the, my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Look at verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel, declares the, the, uh, after the time, that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be what? Right. And that is salvation. That is salvation. It is in salvation that God puts the laws in the heart of man. That the man needs to be, it, it needs not be taught. He will know the right and from the wrong. And this is what he's saying. In those days, no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man, his brother, saying, know the Lord. Because they will all know me from the least of, of them to the greatest. Children in your church, they know Jesus once they are born again. Look what he says. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. When did that come? By the blood shed on Calvary. 
And God has said to Jeremiah here, he said to Ezekiel that, don't say that proverb anymore. A time is coming that I will stop it. But he didn't go beyond that. But he said to them that even in this time, if a father does good and a son does bad, I will punish the son. If the son of the son did good, I will not punish him. And that bad, he said, if you worship idol, if you worship, God still said it in that Ezekiel 18, that if the boy ate at mountain shrine and he dined with the devil, he worship idol, not just for any sin, but for idol worshiping. But then indeed Jeremiah now, Jeremiah now came and said that I have the revelation of the time. A time is coming that God will make a new covenant with people. When that time comes, it shall no longer. It's here, it shall no longer be said. Father's eating sour grapes. And, it's, and when he explains it, the covenant that God will make with you, he will, he will put his law in your heart and you will be his people. He will be your God. And he ended up by saying that I will forgive their sins. And we know the Old Testament, God did not forgive any sin. The sacrifice covered the sins waiting for the atonement of the Son of God. And when Christ came, that is when the sins were wiped away. So it means, therefore, Jeremiah is talking about this generation. Thank God for me. I was born in that generation. <laughs> I was born. If I was born in the time of Jeremiah, maybe I would go and be doing sacrifices. Because my father, what my father did in this world, before God took him to his habitation, ah, may ears not hear it. Are you with me now? If salvation through Christ still hung the, the punishment of our forefathers' sins, then what's the purpose of his coming? It's baseless. If I had to be repenting for my father's sins like Daniel, Daniel repented for his father's sins because he was born under the law. Not on that grace. God had not died in the time of Daniel. Oh, Jehoshaphat gathered in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 20 when problem came to the country and they were repenting for their father's sins. No, not today. As far as you, you, you are born again. You are born again. Your father is irrelevant. Your father doesn't have record in heaven. You are the one who has record as a son of what? God. Error I'm talking about. And every error, if you read the Bible well, you will find the antidote. <laughs> That's the reason why for you pastors, it's the Bible. It is bitter in the mouth, but it's sweet inside. Yeah. Eat it. Chop them. <laughs> Chop them, <and> Bible. <laughs> so, the Bible says, First Timothy chapter 4, 1, the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow the living spirits and things taught by demons. I'm going to finish you now. The, the methods of Satan, the three methods of Satan, this is all the devil has, I want to tell you. Then we will continue tomorrow by looking at keeping your body clean. I will go into the rest of it. The three major methods of Satan, one, influence, two, control, three, dominate. If you look at all the works of Satan, they are divided into those three categories. He seeks to wrongly influence you. And the purpose of it is to control you. And the result of his control is to dominate you. And when Jesus was putting his word, his operations in context, John 10, 10, he says the thief has come but to kill, to steal, to destroy. Influence, control, dominate. And if you look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, it says that Christ has delivered us from the dominion of darkness. So, Satan will come, influence your heart, so once you influence your heart and you give him your mind, he will start to control you. Gradually. Gradually. At that time, you can still do what you want. You can still say no to his control. And sometimes you say yes. Then you say no. Then you say yes. And after sometimes you say yes. And you say yes. And you say yes. And you say yes. You say yes. You say yes. And after yes, 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 he will not sit over you. He's now dominating. At that time, 
People will say, stop it. I can't stop it. Get out of it. I don't know how to get out. Because they have been used. They have, Satan has educated their mind under his control to the extent that he had coded them now. When they wake up in the morning, that is what they will do. If they can be breathing, that is what they will do. He is now totally in control, so he dominates them. That is when you say somebody is possessed. He will do things involuntarily. And those things are terrible things. Even things that will hurt himself. He will do it. Look at all those who are possessed. They will do things to hurt themselves. Some of them, in the days of Elijah, they were cutting themselves with knife. Cutting themselves with knife. What made the someone cut himself with knife over a, a, an ordinary stone? Oh, an image of, of wood. Satan seeks to influence man so that he can control the life of man and then sit on him at the moment. You will not be a victim. Amen. Let's stand up now. We're going to pray. Behold, I am coming soon. Between the years of 1984 and 1999, Apostle Alfred Williams was taken to heaven on various occasions where he was shown global events that would lead up to the year of 2015. And in 1999, the Apostle was powerfully shown the coming calendar for the world. I want you to understand that the first war was in heaven, the first victory was in heaven, and it takes the man of heaven to win the earthly battle. In December 2009, God instructed Apostle Alfred Williams to go into all the world and let them know that I am coming. Beloved, with this powerful instruction behind us, it is now time for us to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Now is the time for the final preparation of the Bride of Christ. A final trumpet call to righteousness in this time that is running out before the rapture of the church. Join us on this dynamic campaign to reach every house in Britain. They need to hear the call. Who will tell them if we do not? This is the prophesied time of harvest. It is now time for us to win every house for Jesus. For more information, call 020 7635 0447 or visit cftchurches.org. The time has come to arise, shine and win every house for Jesus. Behold, I am coming soon.